Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. My name is Mark Medish. I'm from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington, D.C. I'm delighted and honored to be here for the fifth time serving as co-chairman, which means I am a mere newcomer compared with Lord Griffiths. The theme of this year's symposium is Entrepreneurs as Agents of Change. I should point out that this year's theme is quite optimistic compared with last year's, which was the return of political and economic boundaries. That somewhat ominous theme was prompted by the great financial meltdown emanating from my country, the US, and spreading to other markets around the world. The big bubble had burst, and everybody was talking about expected new limits in economic and political life. By contrast, this year's focus on entrepreneurship takes us back to business school basics. The idea of going beyond the conventional wisdom, going beyond the limits of today, creating something from nothing, taking risk and embracing change, this is the iconic image of the business leader. Entrepreneurs are seen as natural leaders. They are to capitalism what knights on horses were to the medieval times. Now there is indeed a lot of business school hype around this concept of entrepreneurship. Ironically, a true entrepreneur might insist that no true entrepreneur would ever go to business school after all, do leaders go to leader school? In the spirit of full disclosure, I should tell you that I did not go to business school. I probably would not have been admitted. Instead, I went to law school, a place where I can guarantee you no self-respecting entrepreneur would ever find himself. It is an elusive, almost magical concept, this creature called entrepreneur. And people can be very protective of their own no notions of entrepreneur, of what an entrepreneur is. You may remember that a former American president was so proud of American business ingenuity that he once declared, the French don't even have a word for entrepreneur. <laughs> I'm not naming names here. It wasn't the president I worked for, but <laughs> as I recall, some of that other president's supporters, very entrepreneurial people on the whole, also tried to change the name of French fries to Freedom Fries. They were linguistic entrepreneurs as well. My own definition, unscientific, of entrepreneur is as follows. Somebody who is willing to experiment, somebody who is willing to fail, and somebody who's willing to pick up the pieces and start again. Also somebody who can sell a dream. In other words, an entrepreneur is often a combination of brave explorer and convincing bullshitter. In my definition, willingness to fail is probably the key phrase. This is so because the successful entrepreneurs we hear about all the time, are just the tip of the iceberg. For every 10 who have succeeded, possibly 10,000 have failed. And the cycle goes on and on. In my view, probably the deepest analytic question about entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship is the relationship between these intrepid risk takers and the economic, social, and cultural milieu in which they find themselves. Are entrepreneurs the cause or the effect of change? We can be convinced that leaders, whether in the business or the political realm, are a very real phenomenon. I certainly am. But we can be equally convinced that the political economic environment, far beyond individual control, broadly the cultural context, has something to do with the process of entrepreneurship as well. This, in turn, raises a number of further questions that we will be considering today. For example, what is the role of the state 
relative to agents of change. For instance, can a state encourage entrepreneurial second chances by lowering the cost of bankruptcy? Another question, can big corporations really embrace the independent spirit of change required for true entrepreneurship? Or was Max Weber right about large organizations, whether political or economic, when he said they are like iron cages of specialists without spirit and sensualists without heart? Is entrepreneurship inversely related to wealth? Do wealthy people, wealthy companies, wealthy countries put a heavy premium on maintaining what they've already accumulated, while people with relatively fewer resources feel less constrained, hungrier in a business sense, and more entrepreneurial? If so, would it have implications for how the state should encourage or could discourage large concentrations of wealth? In other words, is wealth or is necessity the mother of invention? To paraphrase my countryman, Ben Franklin. If entrepreneurship is somehow linked to culture, can a whole civilization be entrepreneurial? If we look at global trends today, might Western entrepreneurship on the whole be waning while Asian entrepreneurship is rising? And finally come questions of values. After all, change by itself is a morally neutral category. But free societies do not long tolerate change without also asking some fundamental questions about values, about norms. As many people in the business world have been learning and relearning the hard way over the recent period. Justifying excesses by saying entrepreneurs embrace the dialectical concept of creative destruction, or is it destructive creation, is not enough. It's akin to saying we're doing God's work, trust us. The question is what the balance sheet of creation and destruction says in individual cases. I feel personally relieved that I do not have to answer any of these questions today. Instead, the symposium has brought together an amazing group of dazzling speakers, distinguished speakers from diverse backgrounds around the world to help us think these things through. And as chairman, I get to introduce them and look smart by asking a couple of provocative questions along the way. May I now introduce our first keynote speaker of the day. It's my great honor to present to you Mr. Paul Bulka, the CEO of the Nestle Company. The title of his keynote address is Entrepreneurial Change in Continuity. Mr. Bulka has been the CEO of Nestle since 2008. He has been with the company for 30 years, so I think he can tell us the Nestle story from the inside. Nestle, as you all know, is one of the largest, if not the largest, nutrition and wellness companies in the world. They have 280,000 employees worldwide. I'm sure Mr. Bulke knows all of them by name. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Sir. <laughs> 